You're listening to another InsideCarolina.com podcast. This is the Letterman's preview for the basketball season. This is brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt. We'll be right back. All right. What is good, everybody? We appreciate you being here on another InsideCarolina.com podcast. I am Joey Powell. With me is Sherelle McMillan. You recognize him from all of the Basketball Scoop and all of the Coast to Coast podcasts. We've got a really uh, neat panel here for you. We've got Jawad Williams, UNC Letterman, coming to you live from the land of the rising sun this morning. Jawad, how you feeling? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Dewey Burke coming to you from uh, Mountain Time Zone in the continental U.S. Dewey, what's good? Everything is good. Nice to be with you guys. What's up, Wad? What's up, Dewey, man? How you doing? <laughs> All right, full good disclosure, I've got, an awkward, I've got an awkward smile on my face because yours truly forgot to hit the record button to start this podcast today. So uh, the first take was absolutely amazing. So if the second go round is not as good, y'all just blame me. Just pretend that, you know, pretend that it's it's going to be just as good. But what we wanted to do today was set up and get, you know, the, the, these two guys uh, were Letterman at UNC under Roy Williams. Uh, Jawad actually crossed over from Doherty to Williams. But we thought it would be neat to have these guys' perspective to help set up the basketball season. The Tar Heels will get rolling on, uh, on Friday in an exhibition against uh, Elizabeth City State. But Sherelle and I would like to kind of popcorn some questions at these guys and hopefully, uh, again, use their unique perspective to help everybody get set up for what, what you might be able to see and what you can expect to see this year from the Tar Heels on the hardwood. So I'm going to ask this question again. This time we're actually recording, so this, this should turn out okay. Transitioning from a longtime coach, which UNC has only done a handful of times, transitioning from a longtime coach in Roy Williams and handing it over to Hubert Davis, one of his longtime assistants, there's just not a lot of history or not a lot of practice going through coaching changes at UNC. So, Dewey, first thing I'll ask you, and I'll come to Jawad next, what do you expect to see differently this year uh, when you're just seeing uh, a new coaching staff? What are you expecting to see differently from Roy Williams to Hubert Davis this year when the Tar Heels take the floor? Sure, yeah, that's, that's the question everybody is asking. And as we were saying earlier, I – I, my four years at Carolina were Coach Williams' first four years. So he, as the head coach, is all I ever knew. Jawad obviously had time with Coach Doherty and, and can speak to a transition much uh, with experience much better than I can. Um, it's it's going to be strange, I think, for all of us former players to look over at the sideline, whether you're watching on TV or in the Smith Center, and obviously not see Coach Williams. But, but for us, it's also not Coach Robinson. It's not Coach Holiday, who's been retired for a couple of years. It's not C.B. McGrath. It's not Jared Haas. I mean, the entire staff has turned over since Jawad and I played. And that's going to be, uh, that's going to be a strange feeling, almost kind of a melancholy feeling. But at the same time, couldn't be more excited for Hubert and the opportunity that, that, he's, that he's got before him. You've heard Coach Williams say this, and, and it's, it's not something that I feel like people say a lot. Hubert Davis is the nicest, kindest individual I have ever met in my entire life. And that is not an overstatement. He genuinely is the nicest human being I've ever met. And so when you feel that way about someone, you, you can't help but root for them with every fiber of your being, right? I mean, I, I, I wish and root so hard for Hubert's success because of the quality of the person he is. Um, but look, he's going to make mistakes. He's going to have growing pains. Um, I imagine he's going to do some things differently uh, than Coach Williams has just because the game is evolving and players are evolving and the way they like to play is evolving and the NBA has changed. So preparing guys for the NBA is different than it used to be. Uh, so all of those things remain to be seen. Uh, but I'm just uh, – so emotionally hopeful for Hubert to do great because of the quality of the person that he is. Jawad, I, I think you have the perspective of while Coach Doherty was not there as long as, as Coach Williams was or you know Coach Smith before him, um, you did see what it was like to go through a major coaching transition. And I know you've seen it a little bit in your pro career too, uh, you know, just in when you go from, uh, from one team and, and transition to another one. But you've dealt with coaching changes before. What do you think we can expect to see, or what, what can the players inside the program expect to see uh, both differently and, and similar this year from Coach Williams to Coach Davis? 
Well, I actually think this coaching change would be pretty smooth, being that Coach Davis has been there for so many years prior to taking the job. Um, so he essentially have recruited all these guys. It's not really – there's no surprises in who he's coming in to coach and who, who they're going to be playing for. So I think this transition would be pretty smooth. As far as playing style go, I think it would go back into probably the 2005 type era where the game is more spread out, a lot of pick and pops, um, having one dominant big man in the post that – any given time between uh, Armando and uh, Dawson. So I think, it, I think it should be pretty fun to watch and exciting. And I think that style of play will get guys more prepared for the NBA as well. That's uh, it's interesting that both of you brought up the NBA style of play because I think that's something that if there was a knock on Roy Williams towards the end of his tenure, uh, it was, you know, whether it's people in recruiting talking about it or just, you know, general fan roar, uh, I think some folks were just kind of questioning – uh, was Roy's style of play matching up enough with the professional style of ball to get guys prepared for the NBA? Um, I want to go back to, to Dewey ask you a question here. I, I know that you were just uh, kind of floored because we heard from you the day after the day Roy retired, and you were really floored by it. I'm going to put you on the spot here and ask you a little bit. Are there any ways uh, or kind of nuances to a Coach Williams-led program that you would like to see change under Coach Davis? strictly, you know, some subtle things on the court, absolutely nothing for me off the court in, in the way that coach Williams represented our school and our program and asked us to carry ourselves as players from uh, how we represent ourselves in the local community to the old coach Smith thing of wearing a suit when we travel. I mean, that's one of the things that I always am so proud of when I watch college basketball games and I see players that are injured uh, for other teams sitting on the bench and they just, they don't look very, very well dressed or you see them showing a video of the team getting off the bus arriving at their arena and our guys are in suits and other teams are dressed in, you know, more casual attire. Th those things make me proud about how we represent ourselves in the university. So I don't know that I would say anything off the court. I, I think coach did an unbelievable job. Um, on the court, it's the things that Jawad said. It's, you know, more of a spread four out one in attack on the offensive end. Uh, I imagine we're going to shoot more three pointers. We need to shoot them better. Uh, 31% isn't going to cut it. Um, but I, I think you'll see a little bit more highlighting the individual in terms of guys being able to create and make plays versus everything coming out of secondary and the, the flow of our motion offense. Uh, I would imagine we'll see that. Um, and then defensively, we've got to guard the three point line better than we have. Uh, there's no secret that that was, uh, that was a difference of opinion between perhaps how coach coached and, and the broader fan base felt. We gave up a lot of threes because we protected from the inside out, uh, which was the way it used to work. Uh, but the game has changed and the percentage of, the way guys shoot threes has changed and the analytics has changed. And so we have to adapt to that and guard the three point line better. So that's what I think we'll probably see is just uh, exactly what Jawad said a little bit more, uh, a little bit more spread, pick and pop four out one in, we're still going to get out and run and play in transition. I bet we shoot more threes in transition than we did. And we've got to guard that, that three point line better than we have. This is a question for Jawad and uh, it's about sense of urgency. So, a thing that I think is different now with college basketball is that it's so much more year to year than it didn't used to be when, when you guys played. And I know heading into that 2005 season. So like you guys lose to Texas in the tournament and then everybody decides they're coming back. And I think y'all knew like, this is it. If we don't win it this year, you know, you Melvin and Jackie were graduating and everybody assumed that uh, Ray and Rashad were going pro. So at best, you know, it was going to be Marvin and Sean coming back at best. Um, and I think this team has kind of a similar feel to it because, you know, there's some guys who have NBA aspirations and then there are some guys who are graduating. So, I mean, it could be a situation where they lose five or six guys after this season. So, you know, how did you guys get everybody to buy in that, hey, we've got to do it the way the coach wants us to do it or we're not going to win a title because this is it for us? Well, Coach Williams preached us awards and rewards. He would always tell us if everybody did what they were supposed to do, we would get the awards and rewards. And those awards and rewards were guys going pro, guys winning their individual accolades, and us winning the national championship. You know, the longer you play, the more you're able to be seen. 
And uh, that really pushed us. And we came together as a group. I spoke about this before uh, a long time ago. Um, before that season, we had a dinner. We all went, to, went out to eat. Um, we sat down, we actually talked about it. And we said, let's get this done. And everybody clear house, we leave. No man gets left behind. Uh, of course, a couple guys decided to stay, Sean Terry, David Noel. Uh, but other than that, everybody else, we knew we were gone before the season even started. So as long as guys are on the same page, I think they'll be fine. Is you think it's hard for uh, you know because y'all had been together for a couple of years? You think it'd be harder for a team like this with with five new guys and a couple of sophomores? Like y'all were grown already. These 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 guys aren't quite where y'all were maturity wise. You think it's gonna be difficult for them, or would it be difficult for them to have that type of conversation? I hope not. Um, honestly, I mean, when you're on the team, you're pretty much all you have. Especially when you play at a place like uh, Carolina, you're all you have. So you have to buy into that family atmosphere pretty fast and uh, hopefully those guys have built that bond and they're able to have truthful conversations with each other moving forward and I, I have a i have a comment to make about that 05 team also that, that can't be underestimated i was on the jv team so i watched from a step removed but i don't think we can underestimate how important it was that that team had three extremely experienced seniors jackie jawad and melvin had been through essentially hell, right? In their first couple of years at Carolina, it was nothing, I'm sure, what they, it was nothing like what they thought it would be. But those experiences and them being seniors helped lead a group of guys that were supremely talented, but to that point had done nothing. And that's a fair statement. I think Jawad would agree with me, right? They had done nothing. Yeah. And so, what Jawad did and Jackie did, particularly those two, as leaders for Coach Williams cannot be underestimated. And the truth is, about this year's team, we don't have a Jawad or a Jackie. I understand we have Leakey, um, but he's, at least from what I can see, a, a quieter, more passive type. So we don't have that. And so it remains to be seen if this, these guys can do anything close to what that 05 team did. Um, you know, also that 0405 team was insanely talented, right? I mean, a number of NBA players, and let's remember who their freshman was that came in that year. It was Martin Williams, who was the number two pick in the draft. So while I understand the question, Rel, it makes a ton of sense to ask it. Um, I just, there aren't a ton of similarities, and, and Joao can expand on this. What, what that senior class brought to that team and their ability to understand the finality of it's, it's this year for us or it's over, it's just different than the group that we have. And so Coach Williams was able to lean on those guys and then all the talent of that junior class and then all the talent that Marvin had to be able to take that team all the way to putting a banner up. That was a unique set of circumstances in my view. Yeah, I 100% I agree with you doing. Um... This year is going to be challenging because there is no real, nobody has stepped forward and said, I'm the leader of this team. And it all starts with putting in the work every day. Um, I wrote about this and hopefully this is the year Leakey steps out in, in the forefront and says, this is my team. Because if he doesn't, his career is on the line. Let's be honest. Uh, as far as NBA, overseas, whatever, his career could be on the line. Um, he has to go out there and be the leader of this team. Armando, He's still a little young. Uh, he has the potential to be a leader, but Leakey's been through a lot. Uh, he's been there for four years now. He has to step up. Um, there's no way around it. They have to find a clear cut leader of this team. And once that gets established, you know, everybody can fall in line and, and be pretty, be a pretty good team. Is it in either your opinion, is it, is it possible for someone who hasn't been at Carolina before this year to come in and be that leader? Uh, I think it'd be pretty difficult because everyone has their mind of what Carolina basketball is and you don't really understand it until you get there. Um, let's say Brady, for example, Brady's one of the older guys on the team. He doesn't understand what it's like to play at Duke just yet. He doesn't quite understand what it's like to go play state at state. So those are it's those little things that he'll have to adjust to as well. But somebody like Leakey, he's been through it all. He's seen it all. So he has to be able to relay those messages to the team. 
So we've kind of talked about where the leadership's going to come from this year. I'd like to transition into a, a similar, uh, kind of a similar realm in uh, player development or in personality development. I want to see from each one of you guys, who do you think is going to make the biggest leap in productivity this year? So that could, I don't know that necessarily has to be a statistical leap, but who's going to make the, the biggest jump from what they were last year to what they, what they will be on the team this year? Uh, Dewey, I'll go to you first. It's easy for me. I mean, it's Caleb and it's RJ. I, I think we've seen historically, at least for Coach Williams' teams, the, the jump from freshman to sophomore year for perimeter players. Uh, when you put the work in over the summer and you get stronger and you get used to the physicality and the speed, uh, we've had a lot of guys historically that have made a huge jump. Marcus Page, Joel Berry, Kendall Marshall, even Ty Lawson, uh, even Wayne Ellington. I mean, you, you can go, the list goes on and on. Um, even Harrison Barnes, right? How good he was as a sophomore. So for me, it's going to be the two guys that have the ball in their hands the most. I think we know what we have with Armando. Uh, hopefully he's a little more consistent. And and the, the transfers, Brady and Dawson, very talented. Brady obviously can really shoot it. But if he doesn't get the ball put into his hands in a position to be successful, there's not a whole lot he can do to help us. So for me, it's the perimeter guys. And can Caleb be more of the guy we saw in those two Duke games uh, and be be a high volume scorer without having to be a high number of attempts in, in terms of how many shots he takes? Can he take better care of the basketball? Can he distribute and score? Uh, and can RJ handle the physicality of playing in the ACC and and then be able to to utilize his knack for scoring, which obviously he certainly has and demonstrated as a high school player. So for me, it's very simple. It starts and ends with those two guys. We've got depth around them. We've got athleticism around them. We've obviously got shooting. Kerwin, we haven't even mentioned. But for the guys who have the ball in their hands, we're going to go as they go. And that is, without question, my strong feeling. Well, it's same question to you, man. Are you going to? I 100% agree. It's going to be Caleb. To me, Caleb is going to be the biggest jump that we've seen in, in recent history. Uh, I think what he shoot, maybe 36% for the field last year. I easily high. seen, <laughs> it, well, it was, I know it was pretty bad, but I think he's going to be around that 50% mark for the year. Um, I, I've witnessed him put in the work this summer. Uh, he worked extremely hard with getting his jump shot together. His mechanics and everything look good. It's just one of the things that he really needs to work on is shot selection. Uh, he has better shot selection. He shoots a higher percentage. Um, and then also the style of play that they're going to play this year with four out one in, it gives him a better opportunity of finishing at the rim because now he's not finishing with two bigs crowding the paint. Mm -hmm. So now once he beats his man, which he can clearly do, he has the, the physical body, the speed, and everything he needs to get to the rim. Now he's finishing over one guy or making a read and dishing it out uh, for an assist. So I think he's going to have a great year this year, and I'm looking forward to it. Hey, Jawad, this is a question for you. I, like I said, I know you kind of play with the guys every summer. They look up to you as, as kind of, um, you know, one of the fathers of Carolina basketball to them because they were, they were young, you know, when you were playing. Um, you can kind of see, it feels like from a look test, like each year, kind of how, they, how they're going to be. Almost like, you know, in 2019, 20, you knew that there was going to be some issues just because of, you know, the scoring and they were, they were a little small and they weren't experienced and were relying so much on Cole. Same thing with 18. You knew they could be good if, you know, the point guard situation got resolved and Kobe White took it and ran. What kind of have you seen over the summer um, as far as this particular team, you know, as far as the look test and, and talent kind of one through 12? Well, I think the size is there. Uh, the toughness is there. And now it's all putting it up to, all together. Um, Armando, I think, is a double-double guy easily. Dawson, if he comes in and plays half as good as he played against Carolina, they're going to be amazing in the post. Uh, Brady can shoot the ball. Justin McCoy, who we, we haven't even talked about yet, he's my sleeper of the team. Um, Justin has – he's very Cam Johnson-ish, you know, saying a lot. Um, but Cam, we got an older Cam, and Justin is kind of like – He's on that path to be a Cam Johnson type player. And if the opportunity is there, I think he's going to be good. And uh, this team has all the right pieces. They just have to put it all together. And the faster they, they come together, the better the season will be. 
Jawad, I remember, um, I guess five, <clears throat> I guess five years ago now, you and I sit in Sutton's, and you said to me, uh, "Luke May is going to be the next big thing." And as the, I'd like to, I like to think that you were the first stretch four to play at Carolina in the modern era. When you said that about Luke May, I remember kind of having that reaction that a dog has when he doesn't understand what's going on. He kind of cocks his head to the side like this. That was me, like sitting in Sutton's. I remember having that reaction. And you turned out to be right. Uh, so I want to make sure you get your propers on that one. Is there somebody like that on this roster? You know, and, and I recognize it's tough to do for somebody like Armando, who was who was really a really strong scorer last year to take that leap. Um, you know, I, I think – Dewey did a great job of laying out the guards and how they might make that change. But do you see somebody specifically in that vein of the, the stretch four uh, that could turn into just a real sleeper assassin? Is it Justin McCoy? You kind of hinted at it a second ago. Is it is it somebody like, uh, you know, like, like Dontrez Siles, who in the clip that the basketball team put up from practice the other day, you know, just comes out of nowhere, offensive rebound, put back really quickly. Who, who do you feel like could be that next guy to, to just come out of nowhere and captivate the, the fan base's hearts and minds the way that, that Luke May did? All right, first, let's start with Brady. Brady is by far one of the better shooters to come to Carolina, by far. Like, I've seen a lot of guys shoot the ball at Carolina. Me being one of them, Brady's by far one of the best. Let's get him out of the way. Now, Justin, he didn't play at Virginia. He was a four or five man at Virginia, which was one of the main reasons he transferred to Carolina. So nobody really knows who he is. Justin McCoy, I'm telling you, is going to be like Cam Johnson. He's going to be the guy who can stretch the floor. He actually can put the ball on the floor better than Cam uh, at that point. When Cam was in college, I'm not going to say that about him as a pro, but when he was in college, Justin is a better ball handler. He His catch and shoot is elite. He can finish above the rim. He's going to be really, really good. Um, and Dontrez, if Dontrez get the opportunity, and I think he will compete for big minutes, if he gets the opportunity, don't be surprised if Don Tress is, you know, a one or two year guy in college and he's out of here. Um, he has everything. He's he's strong. He's athletic. He can shoot the ball, even though his shot looks a little awkward. He can really shoot the ball. He could put the ball on the floor and get to the rim and he goes to the offensive glass. He has everything to be a great three and D guy in the NBA. And uh, so between those three, it's hard to pick which one is going to really blossom. It's going to be they're all competing for the same minutes, essentially. So whoever gets the opportunity, I think that's who, who, who takes off. Hey, Dewey, uh, question for you. So um, I know the, the Letterman have a, a chat and, and you guys are all together and talking all the time. Uh, one thing I've gotten from talking to people around the Smith Center is it seems like they feel nationally they're not maybe getting the respect they deserve um, considering the roster, considering everyone coming back. Do you get that vibe? Uh, do, do, do the former players have that vibe? Do the people you talk to um, have that vibe about this year's team? Yeah, it's an interesting question. You know, for, former players, uh, you, you can go in and out of opinions about, you know, current teams, everybody thinks the teams they were on were the best teams, right? Like, even though I wasn't on the 2009 national championship team, those are obviously all my extremely close friends. And so like the 09 team thinks that they would beat the 05 team. The 05 team thinks they would beat the 09 team. Both of them think they would beat the 17 team. So it's like an interesting dynamic. Everybody thinks that the team they were on when they were, when they were there was the best team or one of the best teams. So you know, for me and at least the guys I talk to, it's it's a it's an unproven group, right? So it's like, hey, they've got some pieces. Armando showed flashes. Guys showed flashes. Obviously, why having played pickup all summer, you know, details what we think some of the transfers can do. But then you throw on top of that a brand new head coach, even though he was an assistant. He's going to with that comes his own style and different things. I mean, the unknown is really what it's is what it is. And so us not having a high ranking, first of all, if you're a player, you ignore the rankings, right? It just means nothing. It's a number. I understand it helps for recruiting and there are other values to it, but as a current player or former player, like the ranking is pretty irrelevant. Um, I just think it's an unproven group. And I think that's a fair thing to say, right? Like it's what I was saying before about you know, the difference between this team 
And then what that 0405 team had, like even that 0405 team hadn't had a ton of success. You're talking about, you know, McDonald's All Americans senior group that had been through a lot, and this this team just doesn't have that except for maybe Leaky. So I just think there's a lot of unknown. I think that's pretty fair. Is it is is this is for both of you guys? Obviously, um, times are different. There wasn't Instagram in 2005. There wasn't Twitter in 2005. Um, but is it hard to not notice the ranking? Hard to not notice? Hey, I'm you know, I'm preseason ACC player of the year, or I'm, you know, all American second team preseason. Is it hard not to notice that stuff? And if so, how did coach Williams kind of get that out of you? And how do you expect coach Davis to get it out of his players? Probably a better question for Jawad, just because obviously he was a player himself that would, would have seen preseason accolades for, for himself and was a McDonald's all American I can just say that I'm glad there was no social media when, when we played because the stuff we did off the court, we wouldn't have been able to play any games. So good, (laughs) good thing that that didn't exist. Yeah. I'm with you on that one, man. I'm glad we did have social media, but um, as far as for the players, they have to have the mindset and understand that preseason rankings and preseason accolades mean absolutely nothing because you didn't win anything. To say you're the best player in the ACC before the season even starts is awful. To me, I don't like it. Um, they have to find a way to detach themselves from social media and everything else, block out all the hype, and just go out there and play basketball. You know, if you take care of everything one day at a time, you know, everything would be just fine. They have to block that stuff out and do it do it fast. Are, are we overrating that stuff? Because whenever you hear announcers or anybody talk, it's like, oh, these kids these days with social media and they're letting it get in their head. Have y'all encountered Carolina players who who let that stuff get in their head, or, or are we just making too big of a deal of it? Oh my God! Well, I think definitely. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Wow. I think the Carolina guys pretty much they understand. Plus, they're being monitored, so you know. <laughs> it, I even send messages to guys if I see something that I may not like, or not even me, but if I see some what can be perceived as being bad i might shoot a text message to a guy like hey man take that down real quick or you know change this you know what i'm saying because if i'm an nba exec and i'm looking at a player i'm going straight to a social media to see what he's talking about and if you say something wrong that could be the end of your career right there you know you can you can end it before it gets started um it's as it has a cool aspect to it you know it helps with recruiting and everything like that but you just have to be aware of what you're doing and understand that the, everybody, the world is watching. So you have to be very, uh, very careful about what you put on social media. Go ahead, Dewey. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. And, and look, there definitely have been examples when, you know, preseason accolades or just media coverage has been something of a challenge for players to deal with. Guys, I remember Tyler Hansbrough being preseason national player of the year and all these things and that weighing on him, right? It, it may not have ever demonstrated itself on the court from what everybody from the outside saw, but I remember if you guys can think back to this, I think it was in 07, 08, he got a steal and went down and did a 360 dunk. And I was like, I can't, I literally can't believe he just did that. And I remember talking to him, he's like, well, that, you know, some of the people in the NBA are talking about that I'm not that athletic, mm. right? So even him, like the ultimate team guy, warrior, da da da, even it weighed on him because he thought there was reporting out there in a pre-social media era that was, you know, commenting on his lack of athleticism as it's translated to the NBA. So he thought to himself, "Hey, I got a breakaway. I'm going to do a 360 so I can show any NBA scouter or exec that's watching that I am athletic." Right. So it does impact these guys. Jawai can speak to it himself, his own experience. You just hope that they're able to continue to put the team first and that's for the staff to help them navigate. Right. Because like Jawai said at the top, Coach Williams was amazing at talking about if we play as a team and do the things that he asks the team to do, you're going to get awards and rewards. And Awards are individual mostly and rewards are team and you can get both if you do what the coaching staff says. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic and 
never tougher to manage than today because you're one click away from reading a bunch of comments of what people think about you, whether they're qualified or not, and you have to deal with that. You know, it's weird. I, I get I feel a lot like Tyler in this sense because I have a lot of people tell me all the time they don't think I'm athletic enough. But you know what I can do, guys, when, when I feel like people are judging me for my lack of athleticism? I can at least look good. And if I want to look good, I go to Johnny T-Shirt. Uh, at JohnnyT-Shirt.com, right there on East Franklin Street in Chapel Hill. Uh, they're going to have you looking good, even if you are not able to play as well as some of the folks we've mentioned previously. Uh, you may not be able to shoot like a Brady Manic. You might not be able to, to hit the little drop shoulder hook shot like a Dawson Garcia. You may not have the step back that a, a Caleb Love has, and you may not have as pure of a, a jumper as Kerwin Walton has, but you can at least look good doing it because Johnny T-Shirt has all of the gear that you need, various brands like Nike, Columbia, Cutter & Buck, and as the season's getting started, go get you some new gear. Johnny T-Shirt has quick shipping. Uh, they'll get it to you quickly. If you want to stop by their store, they'll even bring it out to you curbside. Or you can go in and visit them on East Franklin Street, as I mentioned. Inside Carolina Premium subscribers know that they get an extra 10% off the top. But I can't stress enough, Inside Carolina loves Johnny T-Shirt. Johnny T-Shirt loves us. So we want to make sure you guys are looking good and that you're getting it from the right folks. JohnnyT-Shirt.com. We appreciate them. Hope that you will as well. Take a quick break, let the National Guys community run some ads. We'll be right back with the Letterman's preview for the 2021-22 basketball season Tar Heels. All right, we are back. Thanks for sticking around. Joey Powell here, Cheryl McMillan over there. We've got Jawad Williams all the way from Japan, Dewey Burke from the western part of the United States joining us. Guys, uh, we were talking about it right before the break there, and Sherelle mentioned kind of the expectations that may or may not be following this team right now from the media, from the fans, or whatever. Uh, Jawad, I'm going to come to you first, but I'd love to hear from both of you guys on this. If you're on this team right now in this situation with kind of the hodgepodge of players that you have kind of hooked up for their first run together uh, with the new coaching staff, would you rather be under the radar or would you rather have – uh, you know, that, as you guys mentioned earlier, have that number beside your name, Jawad? I'd rather be under the radar. But uh, being in Carolina, that doesn't really exist, regardless of what that number is. You know, you could be unranked play at Carolina, but you still have a target on your back because you play at Carolina. But I'd still rather be under the radar. Um, all this stuff in the beginning of the season doesn't matter. It's all about what you do in April. Um, so everything else right now is just a waste of time, honestly. Well, and we've seen, too, how the, the ACC media always predicts certain schools to win the conference championship and how rarely they are correct. So I, I, can, I can vibe with you there. Dewey, what about you? Would you rather be under the radar or would you rather have a little bit of a, a number beside you for motivation purposes? Definitely agree with you out under the radar because you can manufacture that chip on your shoulder uh, to, to use that internally and, and speak about, you know, the media and the broader group that follows college basketball thinking that you're not going to be that good of a team. We definitely had that in 2005, 2006, after Jawad's team won the national championship and guys went to the league. You know, we were unproven. Nobody knew what we had in that incoming freshman class. Our most experienced player was Dave. After that, it was Rayshon who didn't play a whole lot and Wes who didn't play at all. So, we definitely had that chip on our shoulder without question, and it served us well. We also had an incredible leadership in David Noel, and we talked earlier about we don't know yet if this team has that. We certainly did. And then we had arguably, statistically, the greatest player in Carolina history as a freshman that year, right? So those things, those things helped quite a bit. Um, but Jawad's right. There is, there is really no uh, lack of expectations and – and belief that you should be putting a banner up at Carolina. We are one of the few schools, there's probably five, that legitimately every year when you start your preseason conditioning and your first meetings and workouts, you actually believe every single year that you could win the national championship. There are other schools that can say that. There are other schools that can set that as a goal. But there are truly very few that every single year – when you meet in the preseason, you say our goal is to win national championship and you actually believe it, whether it was actually a possibility given the talent of your team or not. Like when you sat in front of coach Williams and he talked about that, you believed it. 
with every fiber you have. And not every school says that. So because of Carolina, because of Coach Smith and Coach Williams and what we've done, regardless of where you're ranked or what this magazine or this social media says about the, you know, what your team should or shouldn't do, you believe that you're going to win the national championship. And so with that belief comes the weight of expectation. So with all of the team's in-house expectations, which we don't really know what they are, you can surmise and kind of take an educated guess, but um, with respect to their team goals and their program goals, who is the most important player for them to reach those goals or reach that level of success that they're setting for themselves? Dewey, I'll go to you first. Caleb Love. If you have to pick one, it's, it's Caleb because obviously the ball is going to be in his hands as it was last year. And he needs to play better. He needs to have better shot selection, as Jawad said. He needs to distribute the basketball and get his teammates involved. He needs to take care of the ball and not turn it over. And with a, a more spread out offense that we are predicting that we'll see, he should be able to thrive, use his athleticism to get to the rim. Uh, but again, him and, and RJ is a close second for me. We're going to go as they go. We're going to go as Caleb, as Caleb goes, because as good a shooter as Brady might be as dominant as Mondo could be in the post, as good of a shooter as Kerwin is. And we know those guys have to get the ball in positions to be successful. And that is the point guard's job. And so he's going to go, or excuse me, we're going to go as far as he takes us in my view. Jawad, I'm going to take Caleb Love off the table, and I'm going to kick it to you for the same question. I'm, I know I'm, I'm hamstringing you a little bit, but is it somebody like a Leaky Black who, while he may not be starting, will probably be a, a strong rotation player? You mentioned, you know, can he have that penchant for leadership? Is it somebody yeah. like is it somebody like Armando? I mean, who do you think it is? It's Leaky. It's Leaky for sure. Uh, I knew you. I, I had a reason. I had a feeling you were going to do that to me too, but. <laughs> For sure, it has to be leaky. This this team has to have a leader. It has to be somebody on that team who can bring everybody together, who's been through everything, and who wants better for themselves and the program. It has to be leaky. Um, that like I said, it's the last statistically right. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, like I didn't lead our team in scoring, but and I think my teammates would agree with me. I was the leader of our team. Uh, it doesn't. You don't have to go out there and do everything and be. Uh, first team All American. It's little things that you do as a leader that that makes the team better. And Leaky has to fill that void. He has to. This is his last go around. I hope he understands that. You don't. You don't get this. You don't get to do this again. You know. We all. You know. You always hear the older Carolina guys say, "Oh, if I could do it all over again, I would." This is his last go around. If I could do it all over, I would. If Dewey could do it, all, I'm pretty sure he would. So he has to understand that you never get this opportunity again. You have to take full advantage of it. Weird question, kind of a follow-up to that. Does Leakey have that Dave in him? You know, I know you guys have both mentioned David Noel specifically, but, um, you know, he was a key cog transitioning from that 05 squad to, to Dewey's squad. Does Leakey have that in him? Because David seemed like a natural leader, not only from speaking to him, but from everybody that I know that knows David. He just has that natural leader quality about him. Does Leakey have that in him? If he doesn't, he better find it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to say. I mean, like, like I, I joke with Dave about this all the time. Like every time I, you know, me and Dave talk quite often. So I always tell him I'm forever his leader. Like, you know, that he learned from me. You know what I mean? And I feel like Leaky hasn't had the opportunity to learn from anybody. Right. But he has to figure it out. Um, you know, he, he can always lean on former players. He can lean on Sean. He can lead. It's a lot of guys he can lean on. So he has to figure this out. Um but, yeah, he, if he doesn't have it, he better find it and find it fast. <laughs> Before we get to kind of our, our last question, um, I wanted to switch gears just a little bit for both of you um, because there's been a lot of talk about turnover and change at UNC and kind of one constant really since we all got to school, since we all came in around the same time, is Eric Hoops. A.K.A. And, video guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when, so, like, I, I think – our fan base, they know his name, but they don't really know who he is or why he's important or why he's been able to stay so long. So if, if one of you two could just briefly kind of like tell the hoot story, why he's so important to the UNT program. Do you go first, man, because I got some cool stories about Hoots. <laughs> uh, you know, Hoots, 
You know what's unique about Hoots is everybody that knows him and every former player that you ask, every one of them would say, oh, oh, Hoots, he's my guy. And so this is a person who, whose dedication to the program and to Coach Williams, I think, is documented and understood. Um, but he has a unique skill set that he's able to demonstrate to every current and former player, walk on to – in the rafters, uh, how much he cares about you, the individual, that he's willing to do anything for you to help you be successful. And that means when you're playing and, you know, Jawad and I are 15, 16 years out. And I literally talk to Hoots like three times a week. Um, and many of us do. So uh, just a unique individual in his ability to demonstrate how much, the program and the players mean to him and how much he's willing to help. Um, I have plenty of hilarious hoot stories as well. And, and we've stayed very close in terms of kind of my group, you know, Tyler, Bobby, Marcus, Wes, the guys that I played with and, and hoots and West were roommates. So they're very close. And so, you know, I, we take trips together still we play golf together and we were together in August uh, with coach Williams and Pinehurst and, just done a lot of cool experiences with him, uh, but there is no one more loyal to the program uh, than Air Coots and probably no one I've ever met that cares more about the success of the individual on court and off right up there with Coach Williams, which that's pretty high praise. So, uh, like I said, Hoots is everybody's guy. It's it's funny you say that. Um, I was texting with, with – with Bobby Fraser last week about the Notre Dame UNC game and uh, was going to be in Chicago. And he made, he was telling me about a friend of his at another school and said, he's basically the Eric Hoots of that other school. And I said, well, my, my goal in life is to be the Eric Hoots of anything. Um, <laughs> Jawad, go, go ahead. I mean, I think I made the video guy reference earlier because I think you guys were still calling him video guy at the time because that's what his position was on the team. And now he's so much more to Sherelle's question. Try to explain what you've seen and what, what Hoots means for that transition. So I knew Hoots way before then. You know, me and Hoots were together in 2001. So we're, we're 20 years of friendship going in. And Hoots is it's a lot more than basketball with Hoots. Uh, when any former player needs to be connected to another former player, you go through Hoots. So if I call Hoots, say, Hoots, I need to talk to Vince. Vince Carter tonight. Hoots is going to make that connection. Uh, Hoops love for the program is unmatched. You know, it's probably about three people that if they were not around, the program falls apart. Hoots is number one on that list easily. Wow. If Hoots is not around, Carolina basketball and the family does not exist. He makes sure everyone stays connected. And a uh, prime example of Hoots, I was on my way. I was, I was out of the country and I was flying back to the U S for my wife to give birth to my son, my oldest son. And, uh, it was Hoots. My wife had the call. She said, Hoots, I'm going to labor. Hoots dropped everything, ran to my house, picked up my kids, <laughs> picked up Jackie's kids, had his kids, went, took them all to Chick-fil-A, got everybody settled while my wife was giving birth. So Hoots, Hoots is that type of guy. When I went in for, I tore my Achilles um, 2016, I'm sitting in the room getting ready to go in for surgery, Sean and Hoots show up. You know, those, it's little things like that that make who's very important. And I know he's not just doing it for me. He'll do that for anybody that played at Carolina. You know, whether you're in the NBA, whether you never played another day of basketball, that's that's who's for you. He'll, he'll show up for you no matter what. Well, I, I love the I love the stories that both of you guys are able to, to share about him because I think that he's probably one of the most underrated uh, and maybe maybe that's the way he likes it. I'm sure he's probably not comfortable getting all this all these plaudits and getting all these strokes and attaboys, but... Oh, um, no, he loves it. He loves it. <laughs> <laughs> he, he all loves right, well, it. the cat's yeah. out of the bag. He loves the stroke. I'll, I'll make sure to let him know about this show today so he can come listen to us uh, rave about him. But I appreciate you guys giving that perspective because I, I think a lot of fans and Inside Carolina subscribers, like Sherelle said, they hear that name, but they don't really understand that he is kind of the glue um, of, of the Carolina family, especially in a time like this where there is transition uh, how important he is in facilitating uh, the fabric and keeping that fabric strong. Uh, Sherelle's using the word connective tissue right now in, in my text messages because 
he's a corporate guy, and that's corporate buzzwords. It's connective tissue, so I'm going to say that on this episode just to make his skin crawl a little bit. All right, before we wrap, last question, uh, and this is, I guess, somewhat of an open-ended one, but I'd love for you guys to try to dig into this as much as you can. Uh, Dewey, I'll go with you first, and I'll, I'll let Jawad wrap. Um, if North Carolina wants to achieve its goals this season, then dot, dot, dot. What has to happen? Then they need to have leadership from, as Jawad said, most likely Leakey. And they need to clean up some of the things that plagued them last year, which should come with experience. They can't expect to be successful shooting 43% from the field and 60-something percent from the free throw line and 31% from the three-point line. They've got to shoot the ball better, and we've got to defend the three-point line better. If we do that, we've got depth, we've got size, we've got shooting, we've got guard play. We're very capable, uh, but we've got to do those things better and then lastly stay healthy. That's always the big bogey. Uh, if, if we have injuries to key guys, Armando or Caleb, or RJ, or Kerwin, or Justin, you heard what Jawad said about him, that's going to be a lot to overcome. So they've got a lot of things that are still unknown. They're very capable, um, but they've got to shoot the ball better. They've got to take care of the ball, and they've got to guard the three-point line. If we can do that and stay healthy, we've got a chance to be really, really good. All right, same question to you, Jawad. If North Carolina wants to achieve its goals this year, then blank. Then they have to get after it defensively. Um, the offense will come, but if they can create turnover, create havoc on the defensive end, they can get out and get easy baskets, which I think will lead to a better percentage. Um, it will open up the game for them as well. So they have to get after it defensively. After that, they have to establish who's going to be the leader of the team. Uh, and that's more than that's beyond stats and everything else. This is just somebody that they can depend on night in and night out to go out there, do their job and motivate their teammates to do their job. And after that, last thing is they just have to buy into the Carolina system. Uh, whatever it may look like this year, there's still going to be a system in place, but I think the guys are going to have a lot of free freedom and they're going to have to buy into it without being selfish and, and taking advantage of that freedom. All right. Well, I'm going to stop short of asking you guys to predict us a, a, a record or a, a season finish because I, I think we'd like to leave it here just with kind of some conceptual discussion around the team this year. But we certainly appreciate you guys. Sherelle, you got anything else for Jawad or Dewey before we get out of here? Nope. Just thank you all for doing this. We really appreciate it. Um, thanks right. for having me. Well, Jawad Williams, Dewey Burke, uh, appreciate you guys joining us at your various places around the globe. Uh, always love the insight that you guys bring and the perspective that you're able to share with our listeners and our subscribers. And we appreciate you being here. Uh, for everybody listening, again, rate, review, subscribe. Uh, if you're not, make sure you, you get on that so that it'll get uh, podcasts like this will get sent directly to your inbox or to your feed or however it is that you consume podcasts. But we appreciate it. For Sherelle McMillan, I'm Joey Powell. This has been another InsideCarolina.com podcast. We will catch you next time. Late.